So I'm Sharesty. I'm Violet. And we are Team Antipodes. After we uh, won the design award at Worlds, we, got a, we were approached pretty frequently about how we designed our robot. And as we described the process that we went through, we realized that that was sort of what was unique about it, that we had a process for designing it all. So we put together a presentation so people could see some of the steps that we went through. So as you can see, there are a lot of different uh, steps to our designing, the first of which have nothing to do with design. There's a couple prep steps that we want to go through, um, starting with building the field that you'll be competing on. So we, when we built the field, we were able to get a sense of how much room we'd be able to work with, uh, as well as what kind of obstacles we'll have to maneuver around on the field. After building the field, the next thing we wanted to do was understand the game. If we didn't understand the game rules correctly, we would end up building the wrong robot. Understanding the allowed materials is also very important. We are allowed to use mainly parts from a uh, kit called Tetrix, as well as some parts that you can buy outside, like plastics. But we also emphasize not letting ourselves be limited by the materials we're allowed to use. In the middle here, you can see a nylon sprocket. And on the sides is that same nylon sprocket with the sides shaved off. And then we eventually uh, made that into an Archimedes screw. The last step of the preparatory things that you want to do is to drive last year's robot on this year's field. You'll learn very quickly essential things about the game, and sometimes you'll find things that you can reuse. For example, on um, this robot over here, we had a sort of fork that we used to control a field element, and we realized it was really great for maneuvering the bowling ball. So just with the addition of a few extra pieces, we're able to have our bowling ball capture. Now that you've got all those prep steps done, you can go into the real design process, which starts with strategizing. Before you start designing, you have to know what you want your robot to do. We found working on a whiteboard to be very valuable so that we can get all of our ideas out there and then use some pictures to express our ideas too, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. After we figured out our basic strategy, uh, it was time to research. So, YouTube is a great place to look for past FTC and FRC challenges. By watching these videos, we could see very quickly strategies that have worked in the past and those that haven't. You also want to keep an eye out for devices that fit your strategy. For example, we knew we wanted to make a forklift using a cable and pulley system. So we found this forklift from the real world that um, did the same thing. And we used it as a reference as we went through our design process. Many of the things that you find in the real world will have manuals that show schematics and can give you a clue as to how you may want to design your robot. After you've researched your ideas, it's time to identify what kind of sub-assemblies you're going to be building. So a sub-assembly is a group of parts that work together to accomplish a certain function. So here you can see a couple different ideas for different sub-assemblies that we've had, again using the whiteboard. Our robot is pretty dense, and so we created a buildup of all the different parts. It also shows all the different sub assemblies and how they all work together to make one cohesive robot. So we start with the crate grabber, which we use to grab the crate that we lift up into the air using our forklift controlled by a winch and its drive motors. We have to get balls into the crate before we lift it using the rollers shown there, which align the balls to be lifted up and then get sorted before they're dumped. You can also see here a lot of the different motors and servos and sensors that go into making the robot. And then we have our frame here with our vertical drive system, then our arm that we use to control a bowling ball, which is another field element, and our plastic protective sides. At the beginning of the match, we have to fit into an 18-inch sizing cube. So you can see here, when we're fully extended, we don't quite fit in. But when we close ourselves up, we're nice and snug, and you can see our starting position. Once we figured out what we wanted to put inside our robot, it was time to give them some space assignments. So space planning antici anticipates subassembly conflicts, allowing more complexity and better access. One mistake that's really easy to make is to just put subassembly on top of subassembly as you think of them. However, this is going to make any of these inner subassemblies completely inaccessible. And when one of them breaks, you're going to have to take apart half your robot to get to them. So what you want to do is plan ahead and make all your sub-assemblies accessible from some point, either from an exterior access or an interior access. 
So here's a space planning diagram that we had for this robot in the front here. In this picture, you can see the different access points that we had. We had exterior, ac exterior access points from the, out from the sides and the top, and then interior access points from the back into the sort of cavern. Now that you've got your space assignments, the order of integration sort of goes hand in hand with that. You have to decide what order you're going to install your sub-assemblies so that they don't conflict with each other. And it also creates a build schedule for the team. So now that we had the overall planning done, it was time to go um, dive in into developing and building each one of the sub-assemblies. So the first step in this process was to list the requirements and the constraints for the sub-assembly. After you know what you want your sub-assembly to do, it's time to brainstorm different designs that could accomplish that. So the way we like to do it was we would have an idea proposed and then the whole team would kind of talk about it, critique it, maybe uh, piggyback on it and improve the idea before it was approved. So again, we like to use whiteboards a lot to discuss this because there's some ideas that when you try to describe them in words, the message just doesn't get across and drawing can be a much better method of communication. After you brainstorm, sometimes you have an idea which you're not quite sure if it's going to work or not. So that's where you want to have a proof of concept. So this is an expedient mock-up to test a concept. For example, we didn't know if two chains could in fact lift a ball up in the air, so we threw together some sprockets, some chains, some motors, and tested it and found that they in fact do. After you've got an idea that looks like it's going to work, it's time to identify how this subassembly might interact with other subassemblies that you have. So you can see here we have gears and a sprocket that are doing two completely different things but are in very close proximity to each other. So we mocked it up to make sure that they weren't going to conflict when they started working. This is an example of several subassemblies that work together to accomplish a task. So on the outsides here you can see two rollers that keep the balls aligned while these zip ties push them towards this chain at the end, which will lift them up to later get dumped into a crate. Once you have, have identified the subassembly interactions, you want to mock up your idea. So a mock up is a crude physical arrangement of parts. Um, oftentimes, screws don't even need to be involved. Here, we just place some pieces on top of each other to see if they would fit within the space requirement. And here we only built half of the roller for testing. Next that you have an idea that looks like it's going to work, you're going to need to test that idea out. So here you can see the half roller that Violet was talking about with added weights put on so that we could make sure that we're accounting for weight that will be later added on in extra parts. And here you can see we're testing if the zip tie is going to actually push the ball along as the robot is moving. After testing, it's time to optimize your idea. So optimizations which are helpful in FTC is making something smaller, stronger, more reliable, redundant, more accessible, and sometimes faster. So in this picture, you can see a sort of before and after of optimization. Over here, we have the more reliable version. And then we made our pulleys smaller. And this S-cut we have in the channels here allowed the two channels to fit into a smaller space. Now that you have an optimized idea, then it, you can start marking out and planning the kind of pieces that you're going to cut so that when you do cut them, they are accurate cuts and you don't have to redo anything. For the five steps that you see in the gray box, those are steps that are going to be really helpful to use CAD. Now that you have your pieces all marked up and ready to go, you can start to cut and machine them. This is a part of the process that's very helpful if you plan ahead so that if you're making a lot of one piece, you can use mass machining techniques and you won't waste any time doing the same thing over and over and over again. So after you cut out all your pieces, you can assemble them. And so here we got into some more specifics that would be more helpful to FTC teams. And the last thing you want to do once you've got a sub-assembly put together and you think it's ready to go, you need to test it out, hopefully with another robot. You can see this robot here, before it was complete, was a skeleton. 
and it just had a few sub-assemblies put on that we wanted to test out with another robot to see if they were actually going to work in a competition setting. So a nice thing about this process is that you're testing intermittently. So it means that if something fails somewhere along the line, you don't have to go all the way back to the drawing board. You can just go back to the last time you know it was working. And the unique thing about our design process is the fact that we go through designing and developing and building each subassembly one at a time before moving on to the next one. Also, as you're designing, something that's going to come into play eventually is your wire management. As you keep adding things on, eventually you're going to get a robot that looks like this, and it's very chaotic, and it's not going to run very smoothly. So with the addition of one simple piece, we used a wire channel. We were able to control all of these along one route and have a robot that was a lot more clean. So as we back out here, you can again see the sort of layout that we have for our design process. We were also able to create an animation using CAD so that we could show people just what all those different parts of our robot do. So here you can see when we pick up the crate and then lift it up a little bit so we can uh, drive over to the balls and then scoop them up where they drop into the crate and then after we lift it up, uh, and then after that we lift it up. We get more points the higher we lift the crate into the air. Looks quite dramatic. <laughs> All right, so if you would like to see um, this presentation again or look at some other stuff about our team, um, feel free to go to our website, www.theonerobot.com. Also there, we have some resources for FTC and FLL teams. And if you're all interested in getting involved in any of the four levels of FIRST, please contact us through our website, and hopefully we can put you in touch with someone in your area.